Well, good morning. Happy post Easter week Sunday. All right, great to have you here. We didn't have to bring any chairs in for this service, but we did in the eight o'clock service. We had like 24 more people than normal in the eight o'clock service. There were like eight visitors, first time. That, that doesn't happen very often, that was weird. Uh, but anyway, so glad to have you here today. If you are visiting with us on this Sunday, or you visited last Sunday with us and you didn't fill out a card. Nobody filled out a visitor card last Sunday. It always happens that way though. Christmas and Easter, nobody ever fills out a card. All right, that's okay, that's okay. But if you are a guest today, you honor us by being here. We would love to know that you were here. We would love to send you information that tells you about the church and our staff and the ministry opportunities that are available here. We promise we are not going to come beat on your door. We are not gonna bother you on the phone, but through the mail, we will send information that tells you about New Hope Community Church and we'd love to do that. So uh, fill it out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by and and then we will tend to it very, very quickly next week. If you are a, a regular around here and you've got messages to the staff, you want an appointment, you want to update us on a prayer request or a praise item, take the card, fill it out, drop it in the offering bag. And again, every Tuesday morning we sit down as a staff and we go through all of those and we would be happy to do that with you. Uh, we're going to do something really, really weird right now. All right, are you guys ready for this? This is really weird. How many of you have cell phones in your hand right now? I mean, you got, you got them with you. You got your cell phone, all right? Pull, pull, I would like you to pull it out, okay? I'd like you to get your phone out. And I'm not going to tell you to turn it to silent, okay? That's not what I'm going to do. I want you to pull it out, I want, uh, okay? Um, uh, how many of you have a camera on that phone, all right? I, I want you to click on camera, okay? Click, click on camera. You all with me? Have I lost anybody yet? Okay. <laughs> Get, get the camera. Now, and, and now, you got that little thing that's got the selfie button? Okay, hit it, hit it, hit it. I want you to take a selfie right now of you. Take a selfie of yourself right now. I'm doing it, okay? All right, here we go, here we go. Now, remember, remember to get the phone higher than your chin. That way your chin looks smaller, all right? Snap that picture. Okay, now, now what I would like for you to do you know how to email it? Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to email it right now to it at newhopechurch.net. Now, here's why. Here's why. We've had, uh, we, we've got over the past year quite a few new people. And we start talking about you guys and staff. And nobody and says, who? I can't put the name and face together. Okay, so here, before you email it, put your name up. Put your name with the picture, all right? In the, in the email, put your name. We're not going to sell it. We're not. Email it to IT, the letters IT, at newhopechurch.net. Now, if you're sitting next to somebody and they have a stupid phone, or they don't have a phone, or they don't know how to email it, do it for them. Now, if you're saying, Tim, I, I can't do all this today, great, come back next week. We're gonna have a, a live demo demonstration on the screen to show you how to do it, okay? But um, also for many of you who are regulars, when we go to the directory, it's nice when there's a picture there for us to see it, we'll add it to that, all right? Yes? Address, one more time. The letter I, T, right there at the top. There it is. Way to go back there, Milo. There it is. It doesn't have to be capitalized. We're, we're not case sensitive here, all right? So IT at newhopechurch.net. You have no idea how helpful this will be for us, all right? This is just huge, okay? And trust me, it doesn't go anywhere public, okay? All right, thank you very much for doing something weird this morning. What was that? Oh, uh, sure. IT at N E W H O P E C H U R C H dot N E T. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, be sure to attach the picture. Yes. Yes, attach the picture with the name. Okay, for some of you, we're just going to use it for the dartboard. But for everybody else, it's... it's. All right, don't blame anybody else. This was my idea. So don't blame anybody else on the staff for this. All right, this was purely my idea. Okay, a uh, couple of announcements and then a few prayer requests. Right after the third service today, we're going to have a, uh, a, a brief business meeting. Uh, we're basically going to be talking about two things. We have some uh, elder board uh, recommendations to make to you. Uh, that will not take very long. And then uh, we're going to bring you an update on the building project. Uh, did anybody notice the picture when you came through the foyer? Okay, we had that out back before the end of the year, and uh, we've, we've done some work. Uh, we have some cost projections uh, of what it looks like it's going to be, uh, and we need to make the next step. The uh, estimated cost, uh, without, we've got cost projections, but it hasn't been put out for multiple bids yet. Does that make sense? Okay, because we have to get finished plans to do all of that, but we were able to put it out, get a cost uh, based on what current costs are looking like. That project is about a $1.6 million project if we do nothing. In other words, we pay for everybody to do everything. We've got people in here who have skills. Okay, so we will be able to do some things ourselves. Uh, I really, I know I'm always optimistic. Uh, I think we can probably do it for about 1.2, 1 1.2. 1 .2. Okay, that building over there, when we built it, we're gonna date ourselves. It's now been 22 years ago. Uh, they said it would, couldn't be done for under $200,000. We did it for $100,000. Times are different. It's a much larger building, but we do have people who can, I think, help reduce those. But um, we, we want to talk about that in the business meeting today. If you are a member, you have a right to come and vote. If you are a regular attender, you have a right to come, ask questions, talk. And when it just comes down to a vote, you just have to sit on your hands, okay? Uh, or hurry up and join the church between now and 1220 today, all right? <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, take a look at the picture out there. Underneath the picture, you'll see the breakdown of what the building looks like on the inside and how it will look sitting on the property. Uh, for those of you who may be newer around New Hope, uh, this church has been debt-free for the last 24 and a half years. Uh, we continue to function that way. So when we talk about, and if you were a visitor today, I'm sorry I'm talking like this because we don't, we don't talk about money a whole lot around here. Uh, uh, here, here's the deal. Um, if we do the project, what you have to understand is, those of you who are regulars, uh, as you make a pledge and a commitment to this, this is above and beyond ties in your regular offerings, okay? Because we still have to function every single day here. We still have salaries to pay. We still have uh, PG&E bills to take care of. Uh, we usually function, uh, we've, we've been under budget for the last 15 or 16 years, all right, uh, at the end of the year in terms of expenses. We, we are not extravagant. Uh, we are big, as you know, I am very big, and you have become very big with me on missions, all right? Uh, we have given well over 20% to outside ministries and missions for the last eight plus years. We've always been over 10%, but over the last eight years, we have exceeded 20%. Uh, that, that doesn't change in a building project. We don't get selfish, okay? And so, because this is not about New Hope Church. This is not about any legacy of Tim Rowland, all right? This is kingdom work. And so we don't stop kingdom work while... Uh, we don't want to build that building if that's not going to improve kingdom work around here. And we're going to talk about the reasons for that building more in the meeting. But uh, what it will enable us to do is to have church-wide events together where we can have four or five hundred in the same room, have a meal together. It's going to be overflow for big Sundays like last week. It's going to provide special events, opportunities for concerts, uh, for uh, funeral receptions, which we do a lot of around here and reach out into the community. Uh, it will be a, another venue on Sunday mornings because we are about full each Sunday. So we have another venue that can be used on Sunday mornings. Uh, it provides us lots of options. Plus, it gets our offices out of a triple-wide trailer. Um, <laughs> I've been in a triple-wide trailer for 14 years now. Uh, but, but anyway, it's time. It, so just, it, 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 I think it does some important things for us. And so if this is the right time, uh, God has the resources and it will be provided. But it will take all of us. Some can do little, some can do much. Together is what gets it all done. 
and uh, we're going to talk more about how that looks at the business meeting today. All right, so hope you come and join us for that. Would you throw up uh, the, the montage of pictures for me, please? That is the village of Neonan last Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, our adopted village in Ivory Coast, Africa. Madame Elise sent us those pictures this week. Madame Elise reached out in faith. She invited other villages to come join them for Easter Sunday. You have to understand what a big step that is. This is going to sound really weird, but in that culture, there is prejudice against other villages. They don't partner much together. They don't share much together. She wanted to share the resources that New Hope has provided for the village of Neonan, particularly the new structure, the dining structure, uh, a place for them to meet and gather, brought kids in. And how many did she say accepted Christ last Sunday? 18 people accepted Christ Easter Sunday in the village of Neonan. And so that is, that is kingdom work, folks. That's the reason we don't stop doing mission work while we're building something here, because that needs to keep happening around the world. And this is a place God has given us to uh, invest resources, time, and energy in. And so I wanted to show those pictures to you, uh, to you this morning. Uh, please, as we pray today, I want to remember Clovis Christian Church, one of our sister churches in town, uh, a wonderful pastor over there, Cameron Unruh. And so just in the adventure of this week as you're praying, praying please remember to pray for them if you would. This Tuesday is our Prime Timers Luncheon. Uh, Bob Price, been part of our church for about six months now. He's a CPA. He spoke to a group of us a few weeks ago. Uh, it's tax time. He's going to be talking to seniors about taxes and how maybe you can help in that building project that we're talking about later today. So uh, it'll be a good lunch and also a good presentation. This coming Friday night, uh, Friday the 13th, if you're superstitious at all, show up at River Park Church. Uh, we're gonna, there's going to be a service there about Decision America. It is the California tour of Franklin Graham with the Billy Graham Association. And in preparation for that, this Friday is kind of a citywide launch, an evening of prayer. Churches can come together for prayer and worship for that event, which is going to be taking place on Monday of Memorial Day. All right, the end of May. Men's breakfast is this Saturday, all right? Breakfast is ready at 8 o'clock. Coffee's on at 7.30. We've got a special guest. His name is, is Lauren Bell. He played uh, three seasons as safety for Fresno State. He was an all-whack uh, performer, and uh, he's going to be sharing with us his testimony. And so that will be this coming Saturday here at the church. Uh, you're not too young to come to men's breakfast, okay? Um, rodeo Roundup. This is, you, you know why I'm dressed this way, right? Number one, I would dress this way every day if it was doable. Um, but I have three Stetsons, so I've got to wear them each Sunday for the rest of the month to get them all in, all right? Uh, but it's rodeo month. Today is big hat day. Next Sunday morning, uh, we're going to be serving a rodeo pancake breakfast, all right? It will start at 8 o'clock. The 8 o'clock crowd will get to buy their breakfast and come into church and eat it. Y'all don't get to do that. All right, you all can come early and have breakfast before service or you can go after service out to the big grass area on the other side of the bridge and buy you a breakfast, $5 breakfast, pancakes, uh, some kind of meat. And I don't mean that negatively. It's, I, I, I don't know if it's bacon or sausage that they're serving. Uh, it's not a mystery meat, okay? Um, and uh, juice and coffee. It'll be a great breakfast, $5. And this is a fundraiser to help send our kids to junior high. The cost for junior high camp this year is almost $600. And so we want to help parents reduce that, all right, so their kids can have that wonderful experience and life-changing opportunity. So that will be next Sunday uh, during all three of our morning services. On Sunday evening of uh, April the 22nd is going to be Mexico Mission Night. You can come to church that night and learn about what all of our high school kids did down in Mexico during Easter week. They would love to have you. Tonight at 6 o'clock and over in the bridge will be our evening service. Um, Mark and Chris are going to be kicking off a new sermon series on the book of James. And so if you'd like to come and join them tonight, they would love to have you here. Let me highlight a few uh, prayer requests. Uh, Jack Parker, which is Greg Parker's dad. I saw your dad this week. Uh, yeah, I actually saw your mom and your great aunt. Would that be your great aunt? Your aunt. Yeah, yeah, your stepmom, yeah. And so uh, anyway, I had a good visit with him. 
So uh, be praying for Jack. Uh, he's at ICU at, vet at, at, yeah, at the Veterans Hospital. Uh, got lung issues of a pretty serious nature, but he looked really, really good. So I was excited about that the day that I was in there. So please be praying for Jack Parker. Gloria Garza's memorial service will be here tomorrow. Uh, I found out last week from her sister Grace, who attends our church regularly, that Gloria accepted Christ here at our church uh, because Nan Isom uh, was her landlord. And uh, Nan brought her to church and she accepted Christ and attended here until her health got to such a point that she couldn't keep attending. And so uh, that was very exciting to know. And that service is tomorrow. Then Milt Pierce, uh, part of our church family. Uh, as you know, we've been praying for him as he went through his chemo and radiation treatment. And about three weeks ago, he collapsed at home, went into ICU at uh, Fresno Community Hospital. And this past Monday evening at about 8 o'clock, they disconnected the equipment and the machines, and he went home to be with Jesus with about 18 members of his family and Shelly and I crammed into the ICU unit. It was, um, it was both, um, it, it was the bittersweet moment of um, knowing there's going to be a momentary separation, but great excitement about heaven. And uh, you can be proud of the Pierce family and their love for Christ. It came through in a most difficult time. And so we are so grateful. That service will be here Saturday at 11 o'clock. So please be praying for the Pierce family as they go through this process. Those are a few of the updates. There is a sign-up sheet to come around. Uh, this is for one of the women's Bible studies that meets on Wednesday mornings, led by Tina Brown. They're going to be studying the book of Galatians beginning on April the 25th. If you will be attending that Bible study, they would love to know of your presence so they have enough uh, materials for you that day. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, if they would, please, as they... Oh, how's my dad? Thank you. Um, I was going to share that at the beginning of the sermon, but I'll do it now. Uh, dad is home from the hospital. He got home uh, Monday afternoon. Uh, he has healed up pretty well from his surgery. His blood pressure is back to normal. Uh, his, what else besides blood pressure? Um, anyway, everything physically seems to be fine. Dad seems to be uh, discouraged. Okay, so uh, I, I, I told you he really was disappointed when he saw my face after surgery, all right? He, he wanted to see Jesus, instead he saw his son, all right? Uh, and um, uh, I, we're hoping that, you know, just as his body recovers, it's really been, uh, it wasn't until Thursday he really got a day off because uh, home health care came out on Tuesday and probed and prodded again and he had a doctor's appointment with his regular doctor as a follow-up and that was Wednesday and they poked and prodded and so finally it was not, not really until about Thursday that he got a day off from um, uh, medical personnel. Uh, his sister, uh, Aunt Fern, is out here from Oklahoma uh, and is staying at the house uh, with him along with uh, the rest of the family helping to provide care but she's here for a couple of weeks so uh, he's, he's enjoying her company as well. Uh, he's open to visits, so you're welcome to pop by and check on him and see him. Um, might, might do him some good to see some other faces besides this one. Um, but uh, that, that's where Pops is right now, all right? Um, don't think he's going to make it today. Earlier in the week, he, th uh, well, he thought on Saturday he was coming to Easter service the next day, all right? But didn't get out of the hospital quite in time. But um, anyway, thank you for your prayers and for your concerns. And uh, like I said, he's certainly open to visits. Um, be happy to see you. Let's pray. Gentlemen, come forward if you would. Father, we love you. We're so grateful for um, your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for Easter week and all that it means to us. Um, but Father, the events of Easter were for more than just one Sunday or one week. The events of Easter were for lifetime transformation. And so uh, today, uh, we certainly seek your wisdom and your direction to sort out this uh, post-Easter decisions and uh, what life will be like after Easter. Uh, Father, we trust you with the needs that we've expressed here today from those who are in need of care and comfort um, because somebody very, very important to, to them or us has stepped from our presence into yours Thank you for the comfort that uh, knowing heaven is waiting for us means to all of us. Uh, but Lord, that we still have to deal uh, in the here and now with what that separation, that loss is going to mean. And so thank you for your presence that helps us walk through that. 
For those who are facing health challenges right now, we trust you with their needs, important decision making, leadership, their need for encouragement. Uh, we commit each of their needs to you today as well. Father, as a church, I, I pray for your leadership in this congregation, both uh, the leadership you provide for us as staff, the leadership that comes from uh, the members of this congregation. Give us the wisdom so that we are the church that you want us to be, not the one that we may design and the one that we create in our heads, but, Father, the one which you have planted in our heart. Um, because this is so much bigger and it's about so much more than who we are. It's about your presence in this community and how you can use us, not only for those folks who live here, but as we saw on the screen a few minutes ago, how you have used the people from this area to make a difference in a place that is, is thousands of miles away from us. And um, you're still doing your kingdom work. And for that, we are very, very grateful. Um, Lord, there were decisions made last week. I don't know how many. I know that, uh, I know that 50, 49 people took a book called Jesus Pure and Simple last Sunday, indicating that either made a decision about this incredible son of God whose name is Jesus, or they were investigating making an important decision. Thank you, Father. And however you can use us to follow up with those, uh, Lord, I pray that we'll be as responsive as you, you want us to be. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, Father, we say thanks. We commit this and so much more to you in the awesome name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I invite you to find uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. We'll be reading from there in a few minutes. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's an easy book in the Bible to find. It's adjacent to 1 Corinthians. Okay, so if you can find that one. Actually, uh, if you find the book of Romans, turn right. If you find Revelation, turn left. You'll find it. Uh, I have a question for you. Is there life after Easter? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, it's kind of what I've been thinking about all week. Next, next week, we're going to launch a new series uh, on the subject of heaven. Started talking about that a few weeks ago. So we will begin that series next Sunday, looking at uh, the questions about heaven. Uh, does it exist? What's it like? What can we expect or anticipate? Uh, what's the preparations for getting there? All right, so we'll talk about heaven a little bit for a few weeks. But today we are going to look at this idea of is there life after Easter? Um, Easter, you see, really is more than one week. It's more than one day. The reality of Easter is to be ours every single day. So for us as a church, what difference is Easter 2018 going to make for us? Uh, I think there are two significant Sundays of the year that prompt us as a church to rethink who we are, how we're going to live, and if the message of a baby being born of Bethlehem and that baby being the Son of God dying on a cross for our sins and being raised from the dead. Is that a fairy tale? Is it a folk story? Is it reality? And if we believe it, what difference does it make in the way in which we live? Um, not designed just to be a special celebration. It's really designed to be life transforming. And don't mess around with Jesus if you're not going to let him transform your life. I think last week I said, stop flirting with Jesus. Um, I've, I've had friends who've dated for years. I finally had to say, it's time to fish or cut bait. Get in, get out. You're not doing each other a favor. Okay? Um, and the same thing is true in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's the deal. Flirting with Jesus will not get you to heaven. It won't. Flirting with Jesus will not keep you out of hell. Flirting with Jesus will not give you any bonus points. There comes a moment in time to where we have to say, I believe you are who you said you are, and I want you in my life. So, I want to quote a great theologian today. His name is Napoleon Bonaparte. 
you probably never thought about Napoleon being a theologian. He's known as a great general, all right, ruled most of the world at one time, the known world anyway. Um, I really never thought about Napoleon as a theologian uh, until a Bible study we're doing on, on Thursday mornings with a group of guys. And here are some PhD Oxford graduates who are quoting Napoleon. And I thought, I, I better look at Napoleon in, in a whole different light. And so um, found some interesting quotes by this guy. Let me open with one today. Here's, here's something that Napoleon said. Napoleon said, I know men. And I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I, we have all founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this very hour, millions of men would die for him. And they did. And so my question for us today is, how will we live for Christ in the 21st century, post-Easter 2018? In a season of our world's history that's filled with chaos, some apparent discouragement, and lots of destructive intents. Larry Crabb, an author and psychologist, wrote in a book called Inside Out. He said, modern Christianity, in a dramatic reversal of its biblical roots, promises to relieve pain of living in a fallen world. The message, whether it's from fundamentalists requiring us to live by a favored set of rules or from charismatics urging deeper surrender to their emotions and the Spirit's power is too often the same. The promise of too many Christians today is that you can have bliss in the here and now. You can have heaven on earth. Guys, I got news for you. It ain't going to happen. The scripture says that things will grow worse and worse in this world that we are a part of. We cannot help but experience the worst that goes on. The difference that Jesus comes to make in our life as we face a world that is filled with, filled with cruelty is he gives us a different perspective. He enables us to experience a peace when peace does not seem to be evident. He, he, he brings to us a, a, a sense of joy when our focus is not on our circumstances, but is riveted upon him. He gives us a strength that would not be available to us all by ourselves. He promises us comfort when our, if you're not hurt, why do you need comfort? Does that make sense? If you're not experiencing tragedy, why is there a need for peace? If you're not experiencing pressure, why do you need hope? See, he doesn't take those things from us, but he provides us a different resource as we go through those. And if anybody tries to offer you, in the name of Jesus Christ, heaven on earth, you better hold on to your pocketbook because they're more interested in your money than your well-being. Jesus said in this world, we will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. And so how are we going to allow this post-Easter season to make a difference for us? You see, you and I were designed originally for a better world than what we live in. The Garden of Eden was our destiny. And we all screwed it up. Don't just blame Adam. Adam started it, but we haven't done any better with it. Okay? We've all made the same choice that Adam has made. Until that better world comes, which for us is going to be heaven, we will often have times of groaning for what we're going through in this world. If these observations are true, and I believe that they really are, then what is the difference maker for being a believer in Jesus Christ? What difference does Easter really make? I think Paul gives us 
some answers to that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm, I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's not extremely long. It's 18 verses, but I am going to read it so we can get a context. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 1 begins like this. Therefore, a little brief Bible lesson here. If you see a therefore in the Bible, what should you do? Find out what it's there for. That's exactly correct. All right? Which means you probably should back up a little bit. So I am going to back up a couple of verses. I really should read all of chapter 3, but we don't have time to preach on chapter 3 and 4 today. But let me just back up to verse 17. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory... We are being transformed into his likeness. That's what being a Christian is all about, is being transformed from sinner to saint. It happens instantaneously in our position with Christ. I'm going to get theological for a moment, okay? But guys, hang with me. Um, Dan, I'll pick on you. Um, where were you born? Okay, Sam, I'm so sorry. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> no, okay. You, uh, California, U.S. of A. When did you become a U.S. citizen? The day you were born, you became a U.S. citizen. That was your position in this country, and it happened because of where you were born. That same thing is true when you and I are born again. And what, here's what it means to be born again, in case you have any doubt. It doesn't mean joining a church. It doesn't mean being Baptist, Presbyterian, Method, or Catholic, or anything else you want to put a label on. What it means is, is that you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Period. Plain and simple. It's not complicated. That's what it means to be a Christian. At the moment that that transpired in your life, positionally, you became a citizen of heaven. You became a child of God. That is your position. Now, did you have any idea at your birth what it meant to be a citizen of the U.S.? Probably not. That took some time. You learn, you, you, let's see, was it eighth grade? When did we have... Eighth grade when we had to learn the Gettysburg Address and the, the, yeah, the Constitutions. Yeah, okay. Through a period of years, you learn more and more what it meant to be who you already were. We would describe that as the condition of citizenship. Your position was already a citizen, but you learned what the privileges were and how to, to express those through your life. So now you vote, and now you pay taxes, and now you do all those kind of things that make you a good citizen. Well, that's our condition in Jesus Christ. There are some similarities. We become a citizen of heaven at the moment we become a Christian, but we learn what it means over a period of time as we grow in the knowledge of this book and as we are obedient to the truths of God as we have, have, have discovered them, we now conditionally become who we were positionally. Did I lose you in all that? Please say no because I don't want to say it again. All right, but, but the, the, the challenge of the Christian life is becoming conditionally who we already are positionally. And, and, and just as he had to grow up from an, an infant into a now a full-grown man, being a full citizen of this country, that same thing happens with us. So if you're a brand-new Christian, don't expect too much from yourself. This is a process of transformation from the moment that you do invite him into your life until he calls you home. It is a transformational process of us dying to self and Christ becoming more and more real in our everyday experiences and everyday decisions. So therefore, because of this transition in the likeness of God, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not, remember this next phrase, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. If it's hard to understand, those who don't want it, don't want to understand it. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light. And you know who that one that blinds unbelievers is? Do I need to spell that out? That's the devil, okay? 
Sorry, guys, I believe in him. I believe in Satan ever bit as much as I believe in God. I just don't trust him. See? But he exists, and his intent is to keep non believers from believing and is to get believers to not believe so much, to not trust. That's his goal. That's expressed here. Verse 5, for we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus Christ. Verse 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Now, who wrote this book of the Bible? Paul. Uh, we know him as Apostle Paul. He had a different name before he became a Christian. He was known as Saul of Tarsus. He became Apostle Paul because he invited Jesus Christ in his life and he became a Christian. Uh, if you want to know more about him, read from the book of Acts uh, to before you get to 1 Peter, through Hebrews, okay? Then you'll know a lot about Paul. And go to the theater and watch the movie. Okay, show him right now. I hear it's really, really good. I haven't seen it yet, but I want to. I hear it's really, really good. But this verse he wrote here has special meaning to Paul. Verse 6 of chapter 4, 2 Corinthians. And, and, and let me illustrate why. If you were to go back to Acts chapter 9, and I don't have time to deal with Paul's conversion at great length. As you know, he was on his way to the city of Damascus from Jerusalem. Paul was going to Damascus to do his job. His job was to arrest, persecute, and kill Christians. That was his job. He did that in the name of religion. On his way there, I'm just going to jump in, read verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say, Saul! Why do you persecute me? And he responded with, Who are you, Lord? <laughs> was it really a question? No, it was not. So when he writes here, For God, who let light shine out of darkness. He's talking about personal experience here. He said, This is the way God, I was in darkness doing what I thought was good. And the light had to shine to reveal to me that my darkness was not very bright. And I was transformed. Verse 7, but we have this treasure. What's the treasure? The light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So this treasure is Jesus. We have this treasure in jars of clay. How did Jesus create Adam? Out of the dust of the earth and then some holy spit. God shaped us. Jars of clay. We have this treasure with all surpassing power, which is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Does that sound like heaven on earth? Persecuted, perplexed, pressed, struck down? Doesn't sound much like heaven on earth to me. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our lives. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. It's what Paul meant when he wrote in the book of Romans uh, and Galatians. Uh, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ so that it's not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. So the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. I learn what it means to die every day so that Jesus is alive in me so that you see more of Jesus and <coughs> excuse me and less of me verse 13 it is written I believe therefore I have spoken with the same spirit of faith we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence all of this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Did you hear that earlier? Verse 1. Paul starts and finishes. Post-Easter, we do not lose 
heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix, we focus our eyes not on what we can see, but on what is unseen. For what is seen, it's only going to last a little while. It's temporary. But what is unseen, invisible God, creator of the world, it is eternal. Second Corinthians chapter 4 gives us, I think, three headings that are woven into this chapter that could be labeled like this. What is it that we have? Who is it that we are and we are not? And we do not some things. Let me make sense of that if I can. Paul makes the claim in the we haves that I think help us. In verse 1 he says, we have this ministry. This ministry is the risen Jesus. It's not a dead religion. It is a living Christ. Boy, I cannot tell you how many people over the years have said to me, Tim, church has done me wrong. If I were to ask for you to raise your hand, if church has ever done you wrong, I think we'd be shocked with how many hands would go up. And I never minimize to anybody the pain that comes when the church has done us wrong. But that's not our ministry, folks. Our ministry is the risen Christ. The ministry that we have is in this relationship with him. We have received mercy. That's the second thing. We have received mercy. Verse 1. You see, we cannot be engaged in the ministry if we haven't become the recipients of his mercy. Many of you ask me, Tim, how are you and what do I normally say? Better than I deserve. Often people, particularly outside of church, say, That's a peculiar answer. Or they say, wow, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. You see, we have received the grace of God, and the grace of God contains the mercy of God. And the mercy is he doesn't give to us what we do deserve, and he does give to us what we never could deserve. And once you and I have become the recipients of his mercy, which involves his forgiveness, then we become candidates for his ministry with the risen Christ. Verse 2 says, we also have renounced hidden things of shame. Aren't you so glad most of those things stay hidden? How would you like it if right now we drop the big screen and we put up the worst things you've ever thought or done on the big screen. (laughs) Aren't you glad that doesn't happen? And see, Paul says, hey, I've told you a lot about what I've done in my own life. You can read it in his writings here. But he said, there are some hidden things that I'm glad I could take to Jesus and his forgiveness just as we saw in the opening video and that was powerful the way Milo opened the service today. That was powerful. Peter realizing he didn't have to be ashamed to what was done in the dark in front of just a few people. Jesus had already forgiven him. And then we have this treasure, this joy of knowing Jesus inside these, these jars of clay that are temporary and are broken. What is the situation that calls for help in the we are and the we are not statements of this chapter? Paul says we are pressed, but we're not crushed. Paul says we are perplexed. There are some things we can't figure out about life, but you know what? I'm not going to despair over it. He says I am persecuted. People are taking advantage of me, but I know, I know I'm not forsaken. He says we are struck down but we are not destroyed. Pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. That's not heaven on earth, folks. That's simply reality on earth. Not crushed, not despairing, not forsaken, not destroyed. That is the hope in the midst of a tough and troubled world. 
Listen to how one person took those truths and shaped them into a prayer for his own life. He said, I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked God for strength that I might achieve more. I was made weak that I might learn to obey better. I asked for riches so I could be really happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power and for the praise of men. Instead, I was given weakness to sense my need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but everything I hoped for. In spite of myself, my prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. This brings me to the we do not statements. The very first one that is repeated is near the end of the chapter and also at the beginning of the chapter. We we do not lose heart. Shelly, would you hand me that cup for a moment? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Cheers. <laughs> what does it look like to lose heart? Um, you can actually Google that thing. What does it look like to lose heart? And you'll get some answers. I did that. They had some good illustrations. How about this one? The worst defeat in college football history came on October the 7th, 1916. Uh, Who was at that game? (laughs) When Georgia Tech played Cumberland College of Kentucky and they beat them, are you ready for this? 222 to nothing. It's a record. You can check it out. It's a fact. It was said that Cumberland never made a first down. The much smaller Cumberland players were mauled halfway through the first half. One of the Cumberland backs fumbled the ball. And as the ball rolled toward his teammate, he yelled, pick it up, pick it up. And the other guy yelled back, you pick it up, you dropped it. (laughs) I would say they lost hope. They lost heart. Professor George Palmer of Harvard University told the story of a boy lying in bed until very late in the morning. His mother called to him and said, aren't you ashamed to be lying in bed so late in the morning? And the boy replied, yes, mother, I am ashamed, but I would rather be ashamed than get up. I think he had lost heart. There was a boxer who went to his corner after being knocked down in the first round. His trainer patted him on the back and said, go back out there and get him. He hadn't laid a glove on you. In the second round, he was knocked down twice, saved by the bell on the count of nine. He barely made it to his corner, and his trainer patted him on the back and said, go back out there and get him. He hadn't laid a glove on you. The boxer said to his trainer, I'm going back out there, and I'm going to get him this round, but would you keep your eyes on that referee? Somebody out there is beating the devil out of me. (laughs) He was about to lose heart. You know what I didn't find on the web, though? I didn't find listed on the web the Eichen family from Clovis who lost a son in Afghanistan and a month later lost a son on their couch. Didn't find that one on the web. I didn't find a young couple that I had the privilege of marrying seven, eight years ago. They're not still married today. You know them. Their names are Ricky and Cody. They gave birth to their first daughter, Eleanor, who they knew would not live 24 hours, and she didn't. Their second child, he is so stinking cute. But he's rather severe autistic. Pressed, perplexed, discouraged. Lost heart. Didn't see in there the Brokes family from our 8 o'clock service. Lost a wife and a mother and a son and a brother in a period of a year. They did not lose heart. Didn't see um, the 
Pierce family in there. Had to make that huge decision that could be so challenging of turning off equipment, thinking it's really our decision. <laughs> Folks, in case you're ever faced with that, it's not your choice. You, you may make choices to disconnect or to keep connected. Trust me, you don't make the call about living and dying. I've, I've been in the room, an ICU unit, where families disconnected and doctors said it'll be less than 10 minutes and three weeks later, they walked home to the hosp- from the hospital to home. And I've been in rooms where we've kept people going artificially and everybody knows there's no life in that room. See, the call's not ours, that's God's. The scripture tells us in this chapter that after Easter life is a life where we can face the perplexities and the problems and the frustrations of this life and not lose heart. The second we do not is found in verse 5. We do not preach ourselves. If you ever hear sermons about Tim Rowland, get up and walk out. Quite frankly, if you ever hear sermons about how great New Hope Church is, get up and walk out. If you hear anything preached from here that does not have its center, its roots, its foundation, the skeleton and the flesh on the skeleton of the message that is not centered in Jesus Christ, then you need to get up and walk out. Notice that Paul talks then about the challenges that we face when we have this relationship with Jesus Christ, how he talks about these perplexities and frustrations and troubles, and he refers to them as light and momentary. When you're going through some of those things, they don't seem very light and momentary, do they? No, no what Paul's trying to get us to do is to get this, this point of comparison a perspective that might be different than what we've ever had before. And it starts with with God himself. Think about an eternal God who was momentarily confined for nine months to the womb of a woman. I am so glad Jesus was not claustrophobic. Think about an eternal God, no beginning, no end, and for nine months, trapped, stuck, his head underwater. Nine months. An eternal God momentarily confined for 33 years in the skin of human flesh. The Son of God momentarily suffered for hours to deliver eternal forgiveness to anyone who believes. It is one thing for us in the moment to get a perspective of the eternal, but it blows my mind to try to capture the eternal limited himself to the moment. And that's what Jesus did for us. Uh, here's kind of the way I, I got this figured out in my mind. Try to compare seconds to years. Try to compare inches to yards. Try to compare the speed of a snail. I had six of them racing across my driveway yesterday when it was sprinkling. Okay? I did not pour salt on one of them. I do think I interrupted the race when I backed the car out just a bit, okay? (laughs) But if they'd moved faster, I wouldn't have hit any of them, all right? But, But compare the pace of a snail to a fighter jet. Compare the weight of a feather to a two ton truck. That's what Paul is asking us to do with our afflictions compared to how God will use it to give us glory for eternity. Momentary loss for the purpose of eternal gain. Momentary setback for eternal advancement. Momentary humiliation for the purpose of glory. Momentary defeat for the purpose of victory. Momentary tragedy for the purpose of eternal blessing. That's what Paul wants us to understand. And some of you said, yeah, but Paul hadn't lived my life. Let me answer that question for you. If you were to go seven chapters further into 2 Corinthians, to chapter 11, verses 20 through 27, Paul does share about his own life here. Let me read it to you. I have been in prison more frequently than most. 
I have been flogged more severely, and I've been exposed to death again and again. How many times have you been exposed to death, Paul? Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Now, how many lashes is that? That's 195, okay? Because each time, five times, times 40, that's 200, right? Each time he got one less than 40. So subtract five, 195. How would you like to be the guys in the experiment that figured out 40 lashes would kill you, 39 doesn't? That was, the, that was the process in those days. We won't give you 40 because that kills you. We'll only give you 39. That happened to Paul five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones, three times shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, from bandits, from fellow Jews, from Gentiles. I've been in danger in the city. I've been in danger in the country, at sea, from false believers. I've labored and I toiled. I've gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Does he understand anything about troubles in life? And he says they are light and momentary if you see them from the perspective of of God's incredible glory that he wants to give to every one of us. Our affliction is light compared to what others are suffering. Our affliction is light compared to what we deserve. Our affliction is light compared to what Jesus did for us. Our affliction is light as we experience the sustaining power of God's grace. Let me wrap this up. I want you to remember a few things, and I don't have time to tell you the stories this morning. But Bible history tells us that places of difficulty are launching pads for something awesome that God would love to do in and through our lives. Remember the lion's den? It was a platform for a promotion for Daniel. Prison was the stage for elevation for Joseph to go to the position of prime minister in a foreign country. The dungeon was the platform for the writing of most of the scriptures by Paul himself. The shade of a broom tree in the desert was the place for revitalizing Elijah for even greater ministry. The jailhouse was the preparation time for Peter to find a young guy by the name of John Mark who ended up writing a gospel. An isolated island called Patmos was the arena for the revelation of Jesus Christ to be revealed by the writings of John himself. God has so much for us to enjoy if we just seek the right perspective. He could turn our storms into calms and our winters into summer days, our weakness into strength and our death into life. Let me wrap up. I read a book several years ago called Will Daylight Come? It was written by a guy by the name of Richard Hofler. And he illustrates, I think, so nicely the truth that forgiveness frees us and liberates us and unforgiveness and living in the dark keeps us trapped. There was a little boy who was visiting his grandparents. He was given his first slingshot by his grandfather. Well, you know what a boy wants to do with a slingshot? He wants to hit things. So he goes out into the woods and he practices at some targets He missed them all. He never could hit a thing with a slingshot. As he came back to the yard, he spied Grandma's pet duck. (laughs) On an impulse, he thought, I've never hit anything. He took aim, and for the first time, he hit its target. Killed Grandma's pet duck. He panicked. He hid the duck in the woodpile. When he finished hiding the duck, he looked around and he saw his sister Sally had been watching him the whole time. She didn't say a word. After lunch, Grandma said, Sally, help me wash the dishes. And Sally said, Grandma, Johnny told me earlier that he wanted to help you in the kitchen today. (laughs) Didn't you, Johnny? And she whispered, remember the duck. (laughs) Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grandpa asked if the kids wanted to go fishing, and Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help me with supper. And Sally smiled and said, oh, that's taken care of. Remember, Johnny wanted to help you in the kitchen today. Remember the duck. 
After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's, he couldn't stand it anymore. And he finally went to Grandma and he confessed that he had killed her duck. Grandma said, I know, Johnny. I was standing at the window and I saw the whole thing when you did it. Because I love you, I've already forgiven you. I wondered how long you'd let Sally make you her slave. Satan whispers into our ear again and again and again, remember the duck, the shameful things of our past. And he uses that to keep us perplexed and discouraged and troubled and knocked down. And he doesn't want us to remember that Paul said, I've been pressed but not crushed. I've been perplexed, but not despaired. I've been persecuted, but not forsaken. I have been struck down, but I am not destroyed. Jesus has already forgiven us. We need to appropriate, receive, benefit from the forgiveness that is already ours. Why don't you start today? Let's make Easter 2018 an important season in our life. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you that you no longer whisper in our ear, remember the duck. You whisper, remember my son. He makes all the difference in the world. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, have a great afternoon. Go have a quick breakfast.